Hi everyone, my name is Zane Emmerich and this is Virus Scanning Closed Linux Systems. So let's start off with who am I? I'm originally from Colorado Springs and I work in the defense industry doing uh, satellite ground systems. I do a lot of classified work in high security areas such as SCIFs and uh, like Knox and places like that. So why is high security so complicated? You know, in your standard office, you've just got everything in a repository going through your CI and your CD systems, and you could just, let's say, virus scan your code as it's being saved in the repo. But in high security locations, you know, software can be completely custom, written inside the SCIF, which stands for a uh, Secure Compartmental Information Facility. And it's basically, it's like a big room, it's on springs, it's in a giant Faraday cage, nothing can leave or enter basically. You can think of it as like a black hole. And a lot of the code that we write inside of those can't leave those. They're on one system that's air gapped from any external network. And so what we use for general security are these things called STIGs. They're a security implementation technical guideline and they're created every quarter by the Department of Defense and they provide minimum security requirements. And they're kept up to date for 50 different operating system versions and 120 software applications. Pretty much any current version of Ubuntu, any type of Red Hat, Windows, Mac, iOS, they even have Solaris digs. And they uh, have all kinds of apps, anything you can think of, Skype, PowerPoint, all the way up to Apache Web Server and Postgres and they can be hundreds and hundreds of requirements long and take, you know, if you're doing it manually, take days if not weeks to implement on your own. So there's three major categories of stags. There's category three, which essentially if you have a power outage, it might take longer to come back up, you know, things like that. It's not the end of the world if you miss it, but it's probably something if you're just being careful you should have. And then there's category two, where these could be damaged equipment. It's something that, you know, potentially if you leave this vulnerability open, someone could use it if they really wanted to. Um, it's not like your zero days or anything though. It's just an easy way that you should probably be a little bit worried about. And then there's category one, which are system critical and you actually can't get certified by the government unless you pass all of your category one requirements. And these are like mission critical, you'll fail whatever program you're on, some spy in China could die somewhere if you leave, you know, something like that open. Something important to note though is that um, category two and category three, you actually can leave a few open and it's up to the discretion of the customer what they want or like the government will allow certain things. But category one is absolutely every security hole needs to be closed. And so for this, we use the STIG Viewer. And it's a program that the Department of Defense makes that you can actually put on your system. And it'll tell you, it'll scan the entire system. And it'll go through and tell you these are the requirements you currently meet. These are what you're not meeting. And it actually has guidelines on how to meet them. And so for example, I have STIG Viewer up for Red Hat 8. And you can see that there's 21 category ones that I'm not meeting. 326 <coughs> category twos, and then 28 category threes there. And then inside the requirements, this is just an example. Some of the high category ones can be multiple paragraphs requiring all kinds of changes to config files just to create security. I mean, I could keep scrolling on this website for 10 minutes going through these requirements. And then for example, on this one, this is something to do with PAM and a multi-password lockout and you can see at the top section there's details where it'll tell you exactly how to check whether you're missing it manually as well as at the bottom how to change the file you need to make sure that you do pass. And so now we have all these requirements met, the system's completely hardened and mocked down, but you can't just let it sit there. You know, there's still things to do. Over 10 years things can change. And so how do we keep a system secure over time is through virus scanning and ensuring that there's no malware that's found a way to creep onto the system actively. So there's a few types of Linux antivirus. There's always your corporate players, you know, there's Kaspersky and McAfee and 
those are so bloated that they could be malware themselves, honestly. You know, they take so much space that there's no idea whether they're spying on you or not. But then there's also FOSS software, such as ClamAV. And that's created by the community and updated every day by members of both the Linux community and the government intelligence community. So ClamAV is a GPL software that it's actually funded by Cisco and they pay for an entire dev team to keep it up to date these days. They just finished uh, released version 1.3 and it can run on literally any platform you can think of. Uh, they even have Windows versions called ClamWin. And it can be called manually through the command line or through a GUI, or you can have it run automatically like every evening, for example, something like that. And uh, there's multiple different types of clients for anything you need. You can scan emails as they come in, you can scan files as they're opened, it tracks modifications, and it'll automatically virus scan anytime there's an edit to a file. You can have it run in the evening, like I said. It essentially takes care of all your virus scan needs. And so how it works is the ClamAV Foundation <laughs> provides daily updates in the forms of CVD and CLD files that contain what are called definitions. And they're essentially just hashes of known viruses that are submitted by various communities around the world. And they're put into one giant file that's many gigabytes in length. And then what happens is when a clam scan is run, every file in the given path is then hashed and compared against this giant list to search for known viruses. Uh, something to note is the CVD files are pre-compiled into binaries, and so they're not human readable, and it's what the scanner actually uses. While the CLD files are plain text, and you can see the name of the file compared to the hash and actually read through it if you'd like. And so Clam AV releases two types of programs. They have the standard standalone software that you can download. And they also have a daemon that runs in the background. And so the standard software individually compares every file to every uh, list of definitions to search for. And the advantage of this is it really doesn't require a whole lot of overhead since the file is actually in storage but it's also extremely slow because it can only run on one thread at a time, scanning every single file. And it doesn't scale for large amounts of data. I've had systems in the past where I work where we've had to scan upwards of 100 terabytes. And on a single thread, that does not go very well. And that's where the daemon comes in. And so the ClamAV daemon actually stores the entire virus definition in RAM. And that way you can multi-thread your virus scanning, reading through the entire thing. But then and that comes with more overhead because you can be using 10 gigs of RAM at any given time that's always running in the background, just storing virus definitions. And so for smaller embedded systems, that obviously just can't work when you're working with 5, 12 meg of memory, you know. But the upside is it's exponentially faster. If you have a 16 core machine, you can you know, run pretty much anything you want. And so this is where SSHFS comes in. So I, in my profession, we work with a lot of really small embedded systems in high security that still need virus scan. And they might not have enough storage to actually even hold the definitions, much less the memory to do it in a multi-threaded way. And so SSHFS actually allows one system to mount another system via a local network. And if your network connection is fast enough, you can literally mount entire partitions over the network and edit files directly and see exactly anything you want, such as hashing and virus scanning. So in the second section here, I have an example SSHFS command where you're mounting something on 1.2.3.4 and your slash mount and then you run a clam scan command on slash mount and it'll actually virus scan the entire remote system. And depending on your network speed, your processing speed, this can be many, many times faster than even scanning locally, even if the remote system did have the capabilities. You know, in my example, we had a bunch of embedded systems in racks and we would set up a local network on all of these essentially little NUCs, you can think of them. 
and then we would connect them to the local network with a desktop machine that had 32 cores, and then we would mount everything individually every evening, and then just fire scan the entire thing to keep everything secure. Uh, thank you for your time. Does anybody have any questions? You're, you're mounting with as root. Do uh, you typically mount SSH. To, are you doing like uh, root SSH keys so you have passwordless? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Everything's secure, especially with the stigs. We're not super worried about mounting as root since we're literally in a Faraday cage, and so these are just more, you know, double checking essentially. Okay. Yeah. Um, that was really just one example. A lot of times in. Uh, like where I worked, we would have specific users set up for specific things. You know, it was just easier to type root in the command. Okay. I would, I would imagine these are environments where if a hard drive ever went in, it only came out shredded. It, absolutely. Uh, there are environments where you can't even bring in your watch. I've, I've been in those where they weigh you on the way out. Yeah. Weigh you on the way out. Yeah. No, uh, where I work by federal law, if somebody breaks the alarm, the police have to be inside the building within five minutes. So we literally have a police station across the street from us. Um, I, <clears throat> I've played with SSHFS. I mm -hmm. like FS. Yeah. HFS, although I've never used it for virus scanning. <laughs> um, but, but it works great. But, but I do have the question, why did you... Why do you choose to use that rather than say an FS without using the root squash? Uh, the main reason I used that was just um, ease of access. You know, most of these systems we're talking to are locked down and really only have SSH open. Yeah. And trying to even oh. connect to that was a little bit of a fight, you know, and so. Yeah, yeah. So okay. that's why I use that since it just goes directly through SSH. Right. I was just curious. Yeah, no, definitely. Mm -hmm. Are you happy with Clam? AV? Yeah. No, I love Clam AV. Um, I use it for everything, even like I have a cron set up at my house that I run Clam AV just might as well on systems, you know. But I, I use it for everything. I was going to ask if you use it for your own machine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it's great. And um, Clam AV actually for larger setups. You know, so it downloads these CVD files daily, but for larger setups, like in a corporation, they actually have a mirror that you can just download through, like apt, and it'll pull it and then create a little web server, and so you're only actually getting it from the foundation on one system, and then you can just get every computer's updates from your local system. And so that's one of the things that we've used, like in separate labs around my building, is we have our server room has one major mirror that pulls the updates. And this is open source? Yes, it is. Yeah. How can it help it uh, against uh, rootkits? I'm sorry? How can it help it uh, against uh, rootkits? Um, I'm not really sure on that one, actually. Uh, generally, I mean, just scanning each individual file, I, it should be able to see something. But I don't know the actual technical implementation of Claim AV too well. Their, uh, their documentation is massive, though. Of course, you can also augment that by using something like it, isn't it? Check root kit, or th mm -hmm. there are root kit check commands. Yeah. Um, as well. Um, mm -hmm. No, we could. So, so the problem with root kits is they're so stealth that when you're reading the files and directories, they won't expose themselves, so you'll skip over those files. I see. The only way you can ever find this is if you actually take that drive offline and insert it into another machine read only. And then you okay. can read the raw data yeah. without its file system filter drivers. Okay. Um, 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 being kind of keeping their files on it like a Halo deck mm -hmm. you know, or a stealth. Okay. Interesting. I mean, really, at least in the. Oh, I'm sorry. Next question. Uh, so you mentioned that Claim AV is doing uh, checksums to, mm -hmm. to check existing files against this database. Do you know what type of checksum it's doing? If it's doing something that's a, a hard checksum, or if it's doing some kind of fuzzy checksuming? Because if the mm -hmm. if the exploit is a batch script and you just 
add an extra comment to the end. Now it has a new checksum. Yeah, no, I, I believe it's some kind of fuzzy checksumming, but I'm not actually sure on that one. I know that the database is so large that, you know, there's, I think they, nowadays, now that they get Cisco funding, they update the database three times a day, something like that. And so most viruses, even when there are changes, they can catch things like that. Do you let USB drives in that environment? No. Yeah. That's, that's, that's how the uh, Iranian uh, yeah. nuclear things were uh, mm -hmm. stuck in. Yeah, they put them on the parking USB lot, right? USB drives. Mm -hmm. How do you get your CBD updates past the area? Yeah, so. We, it's actually quite the process. So we have these um, AES 1025-12, AES-512, I believe they are. I can't remember the exact encryption, but they're little USB flash drives that are in the hardware encrypted. And they have a specific like 10 pin combination on them. And so you take it out and you put the files on and then you have to take it back into the system to put the uh, new update files on. You mentioned at one point you do daily scans. Is that your recommendation is once a day or once a week or once a month? Or? Yeah, so uh, we recommend daily scans. And then just because of the process of the updates right now, we're getting new definitions every other day. But we'd like to get that down to daily. It's just frustrating right now. Oh, sure. We're looking for a better system. Do you keep it uh, pretty, uh, pretty manual, or do you do much automation when you're doing your scans? Uh, it's actually a surprising amount of automation, because everything's just on one local internal network. And so we have a script that'll go to this IP and mount it. And then it'll scan that and unmount it and go to the next one. What does it do if it finds something? It immediately crashes the entire thing, takes all of it off, all of the networks, and then there's like a big red light on the monitor that's like, do <laughs> everybody shut off the power, it's bad. No, we, uh, we've had false positives before, but in the last like 10 or 15 years, we've never actually had a virus, surprisingly. But the sad thing is, is this whole thing came about because we did find a virus at one point. It was a Trojan that was in our lab and jumped onto products that we shipped. Mm. And <laughs> that, that turned into quite the issue. So they hired me to design an entire virus scanning program. Did, or would Plam AV catch that worm? Uh, it should have. Have you tested it? Yes, yes, we have tested and it would. Uh, I can't remember what the worm was exactly. It's been probably a year and a half, two years since I tested that, but it, it did catch it, so. <laughs> so I, I just attended a, a talk and I asked a question to the gentleman about the, they were talking about the CentOS, uh, Enterprise CentOS, mm -hmm. and I was surprised, because I, you know, I asked them, that seemed like a lot of that process was, was in order to, to, to up the speed on the, uh, contributions to mm -hmm. distribution, mm -hmm. and, but it didn't seem, it seemed to all be trust on like who actually dropped something in, into the into the distribution. Mm -hmm. And this is, take, you're taking a different approach here, you know, you're running a scan to make sure that there is nothing mm -hmm. that's got it, yeah. that's in the code at this time. Mm -hmm. Now, long times ago, I went to a talk and there was folks from Google there, when Google has their servers built, mm -hmm. they scan them at the point of manufacture. And mm -hmm. then once they've been FedEx or wherever they get from where they're built to, where they use, they scan them again. Mm -hmm. And then they scan them when they're in production. Mm -hmm. So it's continually scanned. Yeah. And yet, it seems that the Linux kernel itself, the folks are just using social trust to kind of mm -hmm. put changes yeah. into the distribution. Yeah. It's kind of like, like right. no risk in... Mm -hmm. social risk yeah yeah no it's really interesting the levels of trust I mean because where I work a lot of the software is written in the lab and then placed directly onto the system and even then we still don't trust our own people so we have to virus scan it <laughs> yeah and it works on Windows uh, yes it does it's not great to be completely honest 
uh, it finds more false positives than you know you'd really like but um it does work you know it runs so well one of the things that i once did or well did for a lot of people actually is to run a linux firewall a linux based firewall mm -hmm. run a lot of i was using kasparic but run it and mm -hmm. that's why i was asking about clam AV. yeah um, and running a lot of um, virus scans on the firewall, mm -hmm. so hopefully I could catch things before they got to the PCs, mm -hmm. where they would do a lot more damage. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we're we're worried about that. We have two or three layers of firewalls, but they're also worried about physical security. You know, one of the things we have is there's a set of rules that you can't have anything within six feet of the walls because they're literally worried about people drilling through the walls and putting cameras in. And so inspectors have to be able to walk by and see that the wall is still smooth. Yeah, in my case, it was a low security. <laughs> I mean, it was a normal environment. So mm -hmm. people were, you know, I was doing a great job at the firewall, but people were carrying hard drives in and out. And, yeah. You know. mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have a funny, funny anecdote. So I had this contract with the U.S. Mints, and so we had a, a lot of security, FBI checking, and so forth. And we were there in Philadelphia one day, and something caught fire inside the Philadelphia Mint. Mm -hmm. The problem was the fire service didn't have security clearance, so <laughs> by the time yeah. they figured out how to mm -hmm. open the doors, to let the fire service in, it was yeah, too late. <laughs> Yeah, some of the security is amazing. I uh, work about an hour away from NORAD, and they actually have a McDonald's and a Subway inside of NORAD, and all of the Subway and McDonald's workers had to take a polygraph and get a top secret clearance just to flip the burgers. <laughs> yeah. That sure makes sense. Are you meeting slash 53 or a different standard? Um, I don't actually know. I don't actually know off the top of my head. Anything else? Okay, well thank you for attending everybody. Um, hope you have a great afternoon.